Hey, we're so glad you decided to join us on YouTube. You're about to hear a message from our teaching team. We hope this message helps equip you for freedom and to find purpose in your everyday life. We stream our online services every Sunday. You can visit us at freedomhouse.cc slash live to connect with us and become part of our online campus. We know that you're gonna enjoy this message you're about to watch. How y'all doing? <laughs> Uh, you guys, welcome to Freedom House this morning. Um, my name is Justin Griffith, and I am a part of the teaching team here, and I also I am a part of the Strong Men's Ministry. Oh, let me hear you say, oh yeah. oh yeah. Yeah, Strong Men's Ministry. We cannot compete with one night. <laughs> uh, all those ladies showing up, but we, we do our best to empower men. That's what we do. Uh, I also want to uh, invite our uh, online audience, thank you for thank you for tuning in. Um, Illinois, North Carolina, Virginia. We got Michigan, South Carolina, and Georgia in the house. So you guys, welcome um, to Freedom House. Also, I want to uh, say, I always love to say things about our pastors. Man, they are doing an amazing job in the community. Um, they came down from Virginia, man, started one church. Now they got three churches in, in the area, and that's the result of obedience. Yes. They left, and they came, and now this is what we have now. So we all get a chance to, we all get a chance to experience that. And I think that's, um, that you cannot say enough about Pastor Troy and Pastor Penny. Also, I want to, Kim, where are you? Kim, you here? There she is, right there. Yeah, yeah. I'm, thank, I'm glad to see you, Kim. I know, boy, I left the house, and the house was a mess. But, you know, we have four boys. <laughs> the house was a mess, and, you know, it's funny. Kim called me one day, and, you know, we're getting ready for, you know, Halloween. And we got one boy. He likes to, he likes to come up with these odd things to be. Like, last, last year, Dylan wanted to be a flashlight. No, he was going to be a stoplight, right? So Kim went out just as hard as, man, worked hard, got a box, put the lights on it, painted the lights. He, he was red. I mean, he was yellow, green, and red. He was a stoplight. <laughs> and she told me this year, Dylan said he wanted to be God. <laughs> and I looked at Kim. I said, boy, you got a hard one to pull off on this bad boy. That's a hard one to pull off right there now. But she's just that type of mom that, like, if they say they're going to do something, she's going to do it. She tries her best, but it's good to see you. I see my mother-in-law out there. How you, Mrs. Kennedy? So we got everybody in the house. Also, uh, Lake Norman campus, man. Think about that. Lake Norman is, I mean, I remember when I first went up to Lake Norman to speak. They were in that high school, the Huff High School, and... The toilets were barely working. Stuff was falling all over the place, man. People had to leave here and go set up. They had to go and set up. They had to do that every weekend. They had to go over and set up every weekend. That's the type of dedication you need, man. That's why they have that campus right now. And I thank God for that. But before I get started, let me pray, and then we're going to get into it. I do believe I have a word for this crowd this morning. I do believe that. So... Here we go. Lord, I thank you for everything that you've done. I thank you for what you're doing, God. Thank you for this day, for this is the day that you have made. We shall rejoice and be glad, God. God, I decrease that you will increase in me. Let this word go forth, and anything that is trying to hinder this word, we rebuke it in the name of Jesus. Let your will be done, Father. We love you. We praise you, and we glorify your name. It's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. So we're in a series called Dark Hearts. In this series, we want people to believe that they are chosen by God to win. We want people to understand that God has equipped you with the tools to be an overcomer. We want, to, we want people to, to know that the enemy does not have the final say-so over your life. In Romans chapter 8, verse 37... It says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. There's a reason that you are still here. 
God has a plan, and his plan for you is to win. It might seem that if the enemy is winning every time you turn around, but he doesn't see what God is getting ready to do in your life. The word dark horse means a candidate or a competitor about whom little is known, but unexpectedly wins or succeed. I love how that definition ends. It ends with who unexpectedly wins or succeeds, which tells me you weren't even on the radar to win, but you won anyway. It tells me that God's plan versus man's plan would always cause you to win. Jeremiah 29 and 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. You were put here to win. Don't you allow your present circumstances and your present conditions to cause you to abort what God has for your future. Which tells me I have to fight for anything that God has for me. Everybody say fight. I have to fight for what God has for me. The enemy will tell you that you are worthless. But God will say you were worth it when I sent my son down to die for you. The enemy will tell you that you would never experience anything different. But God would always come back and say, behold, I would do a new thing. The enemy's told his whole job is to steal, kill, and destroy. His whole job, he wants to steal your drive. He wants to steal your focus. He wants to steal your determination. He wants to steal your visions. He wants to steal your dreams. And most of all, if one thing that he can get, he wants to steal what God has for your future. Again, you have to fight for what God has for you. On September the 29th, 1997, Zion Clark was born with a condition called Ricardo Regression Syndrome. Caudal regression syndrome, a condition which left him without legs. At birth, Zion was given up for adoption, spending more significant part of his life moving from foster home and schools to another. While in grade two, he was encouraged by his arts teacher, who was also the wrestling coach, to pick up the sport seriously. Zion took the advice of his teacher and wrestled until high school. He lost all of his games his junior year. The determined young man trained harder and made it to the semifinals, semifinals in the championships in his senior year. Despite losing his match, Zion gained national recognition and finished high school with a good wrestling record to his name. Currently, Zion, currently Zion is a business management student a uh, management student at Kent State. And he's also a part of the wrestling team at Kent State. He is, he's also training, he's also training to be a world-class Olympian with his eyes set on the 2020 Tokyo World Olympic Games. I love this story about Zion. If there were ever a story about a dark horse, or an overcomer. This was the story. But the most important part about the story was how he was approached by the arts teacher. How he was approached by the arts teacher. Not only how he was approached by the arts teacher, how he was viewed by the art teacher. The man, the arts teacher, did not focus on his deficiencies. He didn't focus on his present conditions. He presented Zion with an opportunity that changed his whole outcome of his life. Aren't you glad Zion had God? Aren't you glad God had a plan for Zion's life? I'm so glad God looked at him and said, regardless of all the stuff that you've been through, I still have a plan for your life. Which tells me, if God has a plan for Zion's life, then God has a plan for my life too. (laughs) I love, that. I love that story. Every time I read it, I love that story. I get, I get teary-eyed every time I read about this story because God has something for all of us. 
He didn't just put us down here to stay where we are right now. God has a plan for your life. As a matter of fact, could it be when God looks at you, he sees his champion. He sees his competitor. He sees his dark horse. When God looks at you, he sees his champion. He sees his competitor. He sees his dark horse. In 2012, 2012, 2013, our boy Brody, our boy Brody was, he loved horses. Just absolutely loved horses. He, 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 he wanted to, to go see the horses. As a matter of fact, one of his favorite teams were the Denver Broncos. That's who, that's who he cheered for. Well, one day I walked in the house. Brody wanted to play. He wanted to play horsey. He wanted to play horsey. And he had me to be his horse. And this horse's name was Kona. So he his friend, Kona, I don't know how he got it, but that's what it was, Kona. So here I am. Brody's on my back. He got the pillow as a saddle and all that other stuff on my head. I can't tell you what he was thinking, but I just did it anyway. You have to go with the flow. So here we have, uh, Kim and I, we had this bright idea. Let's say, you know what, man? There's a horse race in town. We're in California. There's a horse race in town. Let's take Brody to see the horses. Let's take him to see the horses. So we got up, packed everybody up. I think it was just Brody and D Dylan at the time. We took him to the horse race. And, and we got in there, and we, there's a part in this stadium where you can go and view the horses. You can just go before the race. You can go view it. And, and if we went over and viewed the horses and stuff, and I found out that you make him, you can put a dollar or two on a horse. And so I, I went in the stable. I know, you got to forgive me. I mean, I'm still, God is still working it out. <laughs> He's working it out. That was 2012. He's working it out. So here he is. I, I, walked, in this, I walked in this thing, and I look, I'm looking. I'm logging, I'm looking. And... I look, I saw this horse, all black horse, all black horse, horse number six, all black. This, this horse, man, he looked the way he looked. He had muscles on him. He was walking like he was, he belonged in that stable. And I said, you know what? I'm going to put $2 on that horse right there. <laughs> that horse walked away. He knew how to act in the stables and all that kind of stuff. Well, Brody, and forgive me, I gave Brody a dollar or two to bet too. <laughs> But Brody, Brody saw this other horse, horse number two. Horse, horse number two was his favorite horse. This horse was skinny. He didn't look like he would belong in the crowd. And as a matter of fact, this horse was so hyper back there. They had to get this horse under control. And I said, man, and Brody said, I'm going to do it for number two. I was, so we went up there. I, I got my $2. I said, I want horse number six. I just knew this big horse was going to run this race and finish. And Brody said, I want horse number two. And so we went out there, we went and got our seats, and we're sitting, and all of a sudden, they hit the button, and they take off. And my big horse come out of that bad boy running. <laughs> running. I said, man, I'm going to win me about $20 today. <laughs> this horse is running. This horse is running. But about that, that horse got in that curve over there. My horse was getting to fall back. He began to fall back. And by the time they finish, my horse finished last. Well, the skinnier horse, the one they couldn't control, that horse finished first. So when we got our tickets, I went back to the tickets. I heard mine. And I thought I was at least going to get my, a dollar or something back. They gave me zero. Brody handed his ticket in. They gave him $15. This dude was on a two at the time. $15 is a lot of money for a two-year-old. But then I, then, then, then I, I noticed something. I picked a horse based off of how he looked on the outside. Brody picked the horse based off of what he had on the inside. I picked the horse because he, he walked a certain way. And the train on them, both of them were stuck up in the air a little bit. Uh, both of them were like that. So he, he looked a certain way on the outside. Brody's horse had it on the inside. He was ready to run the race. My horse was walking around, had the color and all that. He didn't have the wind to finish the race. Brody, Brody's horse finished first out of all the horses that were in there, which tells me something. I judged the horse 
based off of what the horse looked like on the outside, but he didn't have anything on the inside. Could it be that when people look at you, they judge you so much on what you look like on the outside, not knowing that you have what it takes on the inside? And so Brody won that bet. I mean, he won his money out of that thing. But if you go to 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, it says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance, his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. I'm so glad God looks on what you have on the inside of you. I'm so glad God looks at us on the inside because man might say you don't have it on the outside, but God say you have it on the inside. You have what it takes to be an overcomer. You have what it takes to accomplish what I want you to come to. You have what it takes for you to move on to the next level in your life. You are what God, you are who God called you to be, and you look a certain way, and, you, and you're going to do exactly what God wants you to do. That's who you are. You are an overcomer. Now, I'm going to take you through this. I want you, to, I want you to see these stories. I have three of God's chosen dark horses I want to talk to you about. And when God, when these dark, horses, these dark horses, God chose them to win. As a matter of fact, God has chose you to win. You are God's competitor. You are God's dark horse. He, puts you, he put you here to win. If you go to Joshua chapter 2, verse 17. This is, first, this is God's first dark horse I want to talk about. Joshua chapter 2, verse 17. Verse 17, now, now the men had said to her, this oath you made a swear would not be binding on us unless when we enter the land, you have tied the scarlet, the scarlet card in the window through which you let us down. Unless you have brought your family, your, your father and your mother, your brothers and all your house and all your family into the house, if any of them go outside your house into the street, their blood will be on your own heads. We will not be responsible. For those who are in the house with you, their blood will be on our head if a hand is laid on them. Now, I'm going to catch you up to this. This dark horse is a woman named Rahab. This is a woman named, as a matter of fact, the Bible labels, labels her as the house of a prostitute called Rahab. That's what the Bible called her first. Now, wait till we get to the end of this thing. The Bible called her the house of a prostitute named Rahab. Well, Rahab had found out that the children of Israel, they have left Egypt, and God is on their side. So they are fighting and they are winning. They are fighting and they are winning. They are fighting and conquering, and they come up to this Jericho place. And Joshua, who's leading the children of Israel at this time, he sent two spies out to spy out the wall of Jericho. So here they are. They go to Rahab's house. That's funny to me. It's amazing how God can work these things out. He didn't send the spies to church. He didn't send the spies to somebody's house. He sent them to a heartless, a heartless place. He sent them to a prostitute's house, which tells me God had this thing figured out already. Because if anybody were you, if anybody, if they were used to men coming in and going out, it was the house of the prostitute. So here it is. God, God sent those men to this house. And here it is. The king saw two men go in our house. And they said, Rahab, send the men out. She said, wait a minute. The men came in, they left already. They left, they came in in the morning, they left at dawn. Not knowing that Rahab had hit the two men in her house. And here, they, here, here she is, she, she, the king said, well, well, where are they? And Rahab said, they took off down the road. And she runs up and she tells the spies, now this is what I need from you. I hid you from the king. I hid you from the king. Now, what I want is a promise that my family would not be conquered if the, when the children of Israel, when they come to town. And they told her, here it is. Here it is. Don't miss this. They told her, you have to tie this scarlet card out the window. 
when we see this card, we will pass over your house. Don't you let your mom and daddy be outside of this house when we come through here. That's what they told her, right? Don't you let your mom and daddy be out of this house because if, if they're out of this house, we're going to get them. But everything was predicated on Rahab tying this card out this window, which tells me Rahab had a window of opportunity. She had a window of opportunity. Guess what? God didn't look at her and say, she's a prostitute. I'm not going to give it to her. God gave it to her anyway. See, I don't care where you are in your life right now. You might not look anything with the way God wants you to look, but opportunity, opportunity is coming your way. You might not talk the way you need to talk or live the way you need to live, but there's going to be an opportunity for you to get this thing right. And your job is to hit it. Your job is to hit this thing when God gives you that window of opportunity. And guess what happened? Guess what happened? She tied it and she had all her mom and daddy in the house. They came in, they attacked the whole city. They took the city down. They conquered everything in Jericho. But guess who was still standing at the end of this thing? Rahab was still standing at the end of this thing because she took advantage of her window of opportunity. Ask God for a window. God, I pray for windows of opportunity in this place where if someone... I don't care how you're talking right now. You might be selling drugs at the back of your car, but you're about to have a window of opportunity. You might, not, you might be in the biggest mess that you can be in, but you're going to have a window of opportunity. You might be talking a certain way, but you're going to have just a window of opportunity, and it's your job to get it right. Are you getting anything out of this? It's your job to get it right. She had a window of opportunity, or just a window. Rahab was one of God's dark horses. If you go to 1 Samuel chapter 17, this time is moving, boy. <laughs> 1 Samuel chapter 17, 34 through 37. This is another one of God's dark horses. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by the hair. I love that right there. I seized it by the hair. I struck it. I struck it and I killed it. All right. Let me catch you up to this right here. David. We know the story about David. The biggest story that we know about David is David and Goliath. That's what we know about David. David was a little shepherd boy. He had a stone. He hit the big giant in right in between the eyes, and the giant fell down. And David became king after that. But something happened before David got to the giant. David had to go through the lion and the bear. The lion and the bear. David had to go through the lion and the bear. And going through the lion and the bear, he didn't do it in front of everybody. It was a private thing. See, I'm telling you right now, before you can ever have any kind of public rewards, you got to start winning your private, your private battles. God didn't put him in front of that giant too fast. John, God said, you better defeat the lion, you better get this bear, and then you can have Goliath. But that's a whole different sermon right there. We like to, everybody like to be seen now. All this texting and Instagram, now you want to be seen, all that kind of stuff. Let me get off that. <laughs> so he had to go through the lion and the bear. Let's deal with the, the lion. Let's deal with the lion. If you watch any kind of discovery show, I'm a discovery guy. I'm a, I'm a man's versus wild guy. If I'm going to watch anything, it's going to be that. If, you know, if you've seen any show about a lion... Lions hunt their prey, and it's all about the element of surprise, the ambush. It's all about the element of surprise. And so he, here it is. Here it is. Lions, they, they crouch down. When they get close enough, they attack. So David had to defeat the lion, which in other words, we got to be ready when the lion starts having these surprise attacks in our lives. Things might start coming your way. It's a surprise attack. It's the ambush. And God expects you 
to be an overcomer. He expects you. See, I've had some, Kim and I had a surprise attack when we opened our store. Man, I thought we had got a store and, and, and Satan himself lived in that bad boy before we got into it. If I go back, and Kim will tell you, if I go back, man, we, to get the store open, it took us like 18 months to get the store open. I got a call one day. They were doing construction on the store. Most of y'all, I don't know if you knew, but Kim and I, we own a famous toaster in Uptown Charlotte. And it's, the, it's, the, it's in Uptown right off Martin Luther King Street right there. It's in Uptown. And that's what I mean when I'm talking about the store. So just in case you don't know who I am, that's what, we, that's what I mean. So here we are. We got this store. And I got a call one day. I got a call one day from the general contractor. He said, Justin, you won't believe this. What? What, what, what is it? Because we've already had a few things to, get, uh, to go wrong. He said, man, they were pr putting up some sprinklers in the store, and they forgot to turn the water off. So the guy drilled a hole in one of the pipes, and I walked in that bad boy. Water was all in the kitchen. Surprise attack. What you going to do now? What you going to do now? All right, we, we dealt with it, and we went back, and now we got the store open. So in the famous toastery thing, they always have this thing where they have soft openings, where they allow people to come in, and basically you eat for free. And so we were in there, and the night that we had the soft opening, after we got everything closed, the hood system in the kitchen malfunctioned, and it sprayed all the ansel fluid on all the prep food that we have out. Surprise attack. I wasn't ready for that. It was that surprise attack. So we dealt with that. And so when you know, you know, you get your prep food from Cisco, Cisco's not concerned about their hood system. They want that check to come out of your pocket. So here it is. We get, we get past that. And then we go to our second opening. We get to the end of the day. I get a call from my general manager. She says, Justin, you won't believe this. There's water behind the bar, standing water behind the bar. Are you kidding me, man? Surprise attack. So at that point, I will say that my faith took a dip. <laughs> my faith took a dip. I remember talking to my mother-in-law father. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm not, even, I'm not even two months into it. My faith took a, my faith took a dip. So what you going to do? When the lion shows up, what do you do? So at that point, I had to, I had to say, you know what? Am I going to praise God anyway? Or am I just going to sit in here and, and gripe and complain? So here it is. Here it is. I love what David did. You got to see what David did. The Bible tells us he went after the lion and he snatched the sheep out of his hand. I'm telling you right now, when things start going your way, it's your job to go and snatch back your hope. You better snatch back your grace. You better snatch back your marriage. It's your job to snatch back your finances. It's your job to do that. And the Bible said, he, not only did he snatch it back, the Bible said he grabbed it by the hair. Boy, I love it. He grabbed it by the hair, which tells me he had authority over that thing. See, you have authority over all the stuff that the enemy is trying to bring to your way. And you got to take back the authority. Not only that, he killed it. Which, once you identify what's causing you some problems, once you identify your enemies, once you identify what's killing your marriage, once you identify what's keeping that grudge from keeping you between you and your husband, once you identify that, you better grab it and you better kill it because it's out there to try to kill you. So he dealt with the lion. He dealt with the lion. I had to go and start speaking faith in my own life. You know what, man? Great is he that's in me, that's he that is in the world. I had to start to call those things that be not as though. Like right in the middle of that store, I had, to pro I had to start claiming God's name because the lion came. And what you, when the lion comes, you got to stand up and you have to fight back. So he dealt with the lion and he dealt with the bear. The bear. The bear. So if you, you watch anything about bears on Discovery Channel, I'm going to sweat. I'm sorry. Oh. Uh, the one thing that you know about bears is that they have a really good sense of smell, which tells me they can track anything down. If you leave food out, 
Kim and I, we went up to the mountains one day. The first thing they tell you what to do, not to do, is leave the top off the trash cans up there in the mountains. Because if you leave it off, they're going to find exactly where they are, where you are, what kind of food you have and all that. So here we are. Here we are. David said he got the lion. He had the bear. The bear has a, a keen sense of smell. It's good for tracking. It can track you down. They can track you down a mile away. So if Satan can't get you with the surprise attack, if he can't get you with the surprise attack, he allows, if the bear can track its prey down from behind, then the enemy tries to send your past to track you down from behind. That's what he tries to do. That's what he tries. So if he can't get you with the stuff in front of you, then all of a sudden he's going to start bringing up stuff behind you to get you. The stuff that you used to do. The things that you used to say. The places that you used to go. The way that you used to act. The things that you used to say. How you used to treat your husband. How you used to treat your wife. What didn't work out for you. What didn't work out. What, all the things in your past, he's going to try to get you with. So once you defeat the lion, if he can't get you there, he's going to try to send the bear to get you with the things in your past. Try to bring up the old stuff that you used to do. That's what he's got. So once you realize that, it's your job to grab it by the hair, take your faith, and kill it right away. That's your job. David was one of God's dark horses. And I want to talk about this last one. I got three minutes to get it in. I want to talk about this last one. Genesis 27, verse 18 and 19. Genesis 27, verse 18 and 19. He went to his father and said, my father? Yes, my son. He answered, who is it? Pay attention to this. Because when I get to the end of this, I need you to see this. Who is it? Jacob said to his father, listen what he said. I am Esau. That's what he said the first time. I am Esau. I have done as you told me. Please sit up and eat some of the game so that you may give me your blessing. All right, let me catch you up to this point right here. Jacob and Esau were twins. When they came out of their mother's womb, they were fighting, grabbing each other's heel. Jacob came out grabbing his heel. They were fighting. Well, they grew up. They grew up. And his mom, his mom, her name was Rebecca. Jacob's mom and Esau's mom, her name was Rebecca. So there came a point when Isaac was old and he was ready to give the blessing to the first son. That's how they did it in, 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 in the Old Testament. They blessed the first son. They blessed the first son. So here he is. Here he is. He's ready to bless one of the boys. And the mother heard Isaac tell Esau, I want to bless you. Go out and kill me some of your game so I can lay my hands on you and bless. Up on the hearing that Rebecca went to Jacob and she said, Jacob, quick. I'm going to dress you like Esau. I'm going to go, I'm going to kill something. I'm going to prepare it. All you have to do is go in and give it to your father and you get the blessing. You get the blessing. Now, now Esau was a man versus wild guy. Jacob was a mama's boy. He stayed around his mama all the time. So here it is. Here, here it is. This is the story. Here it is. She gets Jacob all dressed up. She prepared the meal and she told him to go in. At that point in Jacob's life, he was exposed to a lie. Stay with me. Stay with me. It's quiet in here right now. Stay with me. He was exposed to a lie. So when he, when he went in, his dad said, who is it? And Jacob said, my name is Esau. He lied the first time. You fast forward years down the road, Jacob, from the moment he told a lie, he started experiencing a whole lot of bad things. He went his brother was after the killing, Esau. His mama said, go to Laban's house. He went to his uncle's house. He said, I don't want to work for, for, I don't want you to pay me. Just say, when I work for you, I want to marry your daughter, Rachel. Well, guess what his uncle did? On the night of the wedding, his uncle took his other daughter and stuck in the room and he laid with her. Now, I'm telling you, if you want to get into some soap opera stuff, 
Start reading when Jacob and, es and, Jacob and Esau come. When they come out the room, read on from there. You're going to get all you want. So, so not only is Rebecca a liar, her brother Laban is a liar too. He's a trickster. So here it is. Jacob, he slept with Leah, woke up. The I still can't figure that one out. You mean to tell me. All night you, met, you, you with somebody and you can't figure out if it's the one that you wanted. But that's a totally different story. So here he is. So he stuck her in the room. He stuck in the room. Jacob woke up the next morning. What have you done to me? Why did you trick me like that? Now Jacob forgot about the trick that he put on somebody else. Now he's experiencing the same thing he did to somebody else. It doesn't feel good when it comes back around. Now I can tell you that. that it doesn't feel. So here he is. What do I have to do to get the one that I want? What do I have to do? He said, you have to work for me another seven years. And guess what Jacob did? He worked. He worked. And not only did he work, he gave, <laughs> Laban gave Leah and he gave Rachel to Jacob. So here he is. He's still running. He's still running. He's been tricked by his uncle. He was exposed to a lie by his mama. And here he is. He's running from his life because Esau is still after him. And he comes to this point in his life and it starts at verse 30, uh, verse, it starts at verse 26. It says, then the man said, let me go for his daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go until you bless me. The man asked him, listen to this. Listen to this. This is, this is the second question. What is your name? The first time Jacob would ask this question, he lied. He said his name was Esau. This man said, this angel, this is the angel of God. And somebody said, this is God himself. He wrestled with God himself. And the angel said, what is your name? All of heaven is waiting to see what he's going to say. Because here it is, Jacob has the opportunity to destroy a generational curse that started in his mama, that was in his uncle, and is up in him. And he has the opportunity to squash the whole thing now. And everybody is waiting. All of heaven is waiting to see what he's going to say. And God is all the angels are like, let's see what he is. He said, my name is Jacob. He said, my name is Jacob. Then the man said, you are right. Jacob broke the curse then. I don't know who you are in here. I don't know what you've been exposed to. It might be molestation. It might be a lying spirit. It might be what you, how you see yourself. It might be suicide. I don't care what it is. You are God's dark horse. And when God gives you an opportunity to break the curse over your life, you need to take the opportunity. So here he is. The Bible said, you are right. And he changed his name. Jacob told the truth. He changed his name. He said, no longer will your name be Jacob. Your name would be Israel. Jacob's name meant liar supplanter. The angel changed his name to Israel, which means prince. Jacob went from getting caught up in a generation of curse to having a name that can rule and reign over anything. That's what Jacob did. He broke the curse. You can break a curse over your life. You can be who God is exactly what God wants you to be. Now, if you fast forward... Rahab, she's on the scene in Matthew chapter 1, verse 5. Rahab is a part of Jesus' genealogy. As a matter of fact, the Bible said Rahab. Before, the Bible said the prostitute's house, which tells me one thing. If you get it right, God will X out the stuff that used to label you. If you get it right, he will X out the stuff that used to label you. Not only that, not only that, David. He's the only man in the Bible, the only man in the Bible that God says, David, a man's after God's own heart. No one else got that label. David is the only one that got it. And then Jacob. We know Jacob. Abraham. 
Isaac. And Jacob, how did Jacob end in those two? We know about Abraham, the father of faith. Isaac, we know about Isaac. And Jacob, the supplanter, he ended up where we are still talking about all three today. Stand on your feet. I'm done. This is your opportunity. You have a window of opportunity to change your whole life around. That's what the dark horse is. You have an opportunity. You just want an opportunity to change your whole life around. With all heads bowed and all eyes closed. You know you need God in your life and this is your opportunity. This is your opportunity. You need him in your life. This is a window that he has for you. And you know you need him in your life. If you want God to come into your life and turn your whole life around, I don't care what, what society labeled you at one time. I don't care what you're going through or what you were born into. Jacob was born into something. Rahab had a problem that, she de that was dealt with. But here, he are, here they are. They had opportunities. If this is your opportunity to be saved and have God to come into your life, let me, th let me see you throw that hand up just as fast as you can throw it up. I see it. I see those hands. Any more hands? I see all, yep, get them on up high so I can see. I see those hands. All right, I'm praying. God, I thank you right now for this opportunity. God, we thank you for the souls right now that are being saved, God. Lives being changed, God. You are doing a new thing. I thank you right now, God. Thank you for having us in this place. Thank you for teaching us this morning, God. Thank you for your spirit roaming in this place. We ask you to invade those lives. Lord, take out what needs to be taken out. Put in what needs to be put in, God. You are the potter. We are the clay. Have your way, God. We thank you. We love you. And we praise you. It's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and join us for online services. If you'd like to learn more about Freedom House or how you can become part of our church, visit our website at freedomhouse.cc.